Yeah. And uh, so my partner, like, I guess it was the beginning of yesterday's video and you were like singing to yourself at the very beginning Excellent. and he like paused his game and he started looking around he's like uh, what is that what are you listening to <laughs> i was like it's just the stream like you can ignore it <laughs> oh lord that's pretty funny hey should i put my camera on i probably should put my camera on okay you're gonna, you're gonna stop seeing me on hello everybody welcome to the stream by the way um we are joined today by another dr blair akbar all right. <laughs> Dr. Yes, Dr. Blair Apgar, which is still something I'm not quite used to quite as a title. To, but... Yeah, with, uh, I mean, we have a whole zero viewers right now, so that's for people that will watch the stream afterwards. <laughs> um, but most of you know her. Um, she's, a, she's a member in the chat all the time, out of the four of us, so it's not, not no, nobody's going to be surprised. And uh, we're discussing the illuminations in Vita, the Vita Matildes. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> very See, good. very official. Very professional. Very, very, very different. Professional. <laughs> it's a I whole like... different feel. It's fantastic. Honestly, every time I do any kind of presentation, um, <laughs> I'm immediately like, I'm such a professional. I'm so professional. And then it's like memes and gifts and like weird sound effects. <laughs> uh, well, are we going to start with 19R? Hey, let's give it a couple of minutes. Hey, yeah, hey let's start... Welcome. Let's start at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, well, is that the very first elimination? So tell me. No, like, the, so yeah, the first well, one's actually on oh, 7B. Yeah, that, that, I just love um, that because that's a key one, isn't it? That's a beautiful. Yeah. This is like... It's a really unique um, picture because during this period, we don't actually have a lot about authors, really specifically authors like the construct. Yeah. Um, and yet we have, not only do we have Donitzo, the author himself, kind of talking about himself as the author, and kind of goes through great lengths to compare himself to the classic authors like Horace mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. um, just kind of, yeah, Plato. Yeah, humbly, humble, humble comparisons. Yeah, from the... so humble. I mean, his Latin is really, is quite, it's quite poor. Um, it's not, it's not terrible, but it's very mediocre. We're, we've seen um, worse in our documents, but it's not, it's not the best <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. But really interestingly, um, in this, it's kind of a, it's a donor portrait. So we have Matilda in the center. Mm -hmm. Um, kind of enthroned on one of her, probably at Canosa. We don't actually know because that's destroyed. We don't have anything from it. But um, we have her advisor, oh. Arduino, on one side. Um, and then we have the author himself, Donitzo the monk, with a little, the haircut and the book, um, literally yeah. presenting the manuscript to Matilda, which is just, um, it's a really beautiful image, but there's not a whole lot to compare it to during this period. That is wild, because of course uh, the author painting himself in, a, in its own painting is reasonably common afterwards. Yeah, it? it becomes common, um, yeah. particularly kind of later in the 12th century, 13th century, etc. Um, but in 1115, when we think that this is like kind of done, 1115, yeah. 1116, um, to kind of have the author as a construct, uh, from what I've talked to about with some kind of uh, literary scholars of the period, they're really not sure what to do about this, um, particularly since a lot of this, the research that comes out of England and France um, and Germany, to some extent, kind of indicates that this is not that common. Um, huh. And that poor Donitzo is kind of a standalone guy. Well, it's great for him, though, right? He it, it sets a precedent. I mean, that's true. Yeah, good for him. But like, also, I kind of feel sad for him because imagine like your most mediocre school paper is like what everyone remembers you for <laughs> what else is and you're what like else is i'm the write? best <laughs> <laughs> what else? oh god that would be so funny my first publishing <laughs> like i'm like horace and plato here is my 17 year old here is my work <laughs> <laughs> my work I'm wow he's the first guy that sets the thing in ever and that's my <laughs> <laughs> but like that's i mean because we don't have any other work by this guy mm -hmm. and we're not even mm -hmm. really sure where this manuscript comes from mm -hmm. um because by all accounts, it appears to just kind of come from Canosa, and that's just, we don't have any other manuscripts from there. That's wild, um, really? Yeah, and so, yeah, that, this is the only one. Um, oh. And so there's some theories that suggest that it was actually made nearby at San Benedetto, which is um, an abbey outside of Mancho. It's about 60 Maybe. kilometers. For people that don't know where Canosa is, I can just put it on the map. Well, the remnants of it, anyway. <laughs> so, can I, what, sorry, I want to pick up on that because I didn't know. I thought it was at Silla Town, Canosa. It is. 
Um, but the castle is like it's, it's ruined. Destroyed, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's like yeah. Okay. It fell apart. I think in the 16th century. Don't quote me on that. But like that's sure. I think when it fell into disrepair. Um, she didn't have an heir, but then it kind of got taken over. The Gonzagas ended up taking a lot of the kind of prestige from the family line. Sure. Do you see this? Uh, Do, is yeah, that, yeah. Is that right? Is that a one? Am I on the right? Yeah, that's, I think that that's it. Um, yeah, okay. well, it's still pretty intact to me, you know, I guess. Well, yeah, but like the exterior versus the interior. This is more, this is more like, if, okay, fair. If you look at this guy, that's probably more like it, yeah. It's okay. um, it's a really interesting location actually, because it's it kind of sits on this hill, um, which gives it a really kind of unique and defensible position. Yeah. It's one of the reasons why they ended up going there for the meeting because it's See. you know it's such a, a a protected fort. It's literally you have to climb a mountain to get there. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. I thought it was. You know, it, funny stories when, when you hear these places and you don't really know. Hey, Edwin, welcome to the stream. And you don't really know where it is. I thought it was far, far in, far north, a bit further north, mm -hmm. and more on the Apennines themselves. But this seems to be on the hills of the Apennines, isn't it? Yeah, it's not, it's, so it's not quite in there. Interesting. Look at that. It's wild. That's fantastic. And it's really far down from Bologna. This, this is just classic, you know, because it's not even in Tuscan, is it? It's in, in very close to the Gemilia. Yeah, it's oh. her. So I actually just kind of finished um, mapping out all of her charters. I, I finagled this kind of cool Ooh, heat map. Ooh, fantastic. Um, I want to see that. Can I see that? Is that, is that not oh, I, oh, it's, I don't have it. Like, I couldn't share it with you because mm. I'm not really sure how to. <laughs> I'll show it at some point. I'll take a screenshot mm -hmm, of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but her association with Tuscany, I think, is, like, way overblown. The fact that, like, she's remembered as Matilda of Tuscany, I think, is kind of it's ridiculous. Just... When you see the, the bulk of her charters happen it's in... more northerly. That must be, for, for Elizard, who is not here yet, sadly, but it must be interesting for him, actually, to it... kind of do his own work, possibly. I don't know. It's really interesting, because, like, her charters oh, have been um, transcribed and kind of available, yeah. I think, since, like, the eight, late 80s. Yeah. Um... But I don't think anyone's mapped them, so I don't know that anyone's actually kind of Realized seen this. them in relation. Yeah, because like I did a, a very <sighs> brief kind of map in my dissertation that kind of looks at her movement um, and looking at the the reality of uh, I forgot what event it was that she was attending of that I was postulating that it was possible based on her charters, <laughs> um, and it was kind of gave me this idea that well. You know, we don't actually, when you look at them all together over the span of, you know, her lifetime from, you know, 1072 to 1115, you see that she does a lot of movement, but really doesn't, she tends to stay more north than she does really anywhere around Florence, which has this crazy association with her, despite it being like, in a lot of places, very tenuous um, and not really well preserved. Interesting. That's fascinating. That's glorious. There we, that's that's where we got from the first uh, from our first illumination. So that we're we're on a good track. <laughs> for oh, I guess if anyone has any questions, um, yes. Uh, welcome everybody to... in the chat. I think I think what do we have? We have definitely Elizabeth here. I was I mentioned her name because Matilda is uh, clearly very important in the in the in Romania and Emilia in Emilia, right? Especially mm -hmm. um, and very close. I, I didn't realize Canossa was close to Bologna personally. Um, well, so she doesn't been... have a lot to do with Bologna, though. She, oh, wow. which is, I find, I, you know what? I don't really know. Um, she, it's very strange, particularly since I think, uh, so she has a lot of her power based in Mantua, um, which was where her father kind of had his ducal palace and it was a very important homestead and kind of remained that way until that 1080s when they sided with the emperor and then she basically disowned them. Um, but I, I think, and there's a lot of, I think, really persuasive evidence, my dissertation included, that she is trying to recreate this kind of Jerusalem um, setup with the buildings at the same way that, you know, you see in Bologna, having it in Mantua instead and kind of relocating this new Jerusalem outside of Bologna, which is not a city that's very favorable to her, yeah, to one that at the time was very favorable to her. At the time, because then it stops being favorable to her, I assume. Yeah, the the <laughs> the Mantuans <laughs> rebelled really hard. Um, okay. And after like 1084, they never really um, the kind of the connection between her and the city kind of deteriorated until 
they briefly reconciled right before her death in 1114. And then there was a rumor that went around that she died and the city like celebrated, like really like, basically rioted in yeah, she celebration. Wasn't happy about that. She's she like, wasn't I happy. am not dead, excuse <laughs> you. And, oh, and and like there was a brief like like armed skirmish about it. Um and then she died in 1115. <laughs> But it was it became pretty clear that they weren't really happy with the amount of um, I think it's got a lot to do with like the taxes that she levied and the, the toll and such. Yeah, and the emperor was like a lot. He was a lot more willing to give them like a free pass oh, and basically be like, you don't have to pay these as long as you're on my side. It doesn't right. matter. Yeah, yeah, that's very powerful. That's a very powerful, powerful incentive. And also, if you're not on my side, I might destroy you as well. By the way, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but and also he, he did. Um, he really did. There was so. Actually, that kind of leads me back to the manuscript. Mm -hmm. There are some suggestions um, that this is not fully done. There's another one from uh, San Benedetto okay. that's okay. it's also not fully done. Um, I don't know if I agree with that because the the main il illuminations um, are, are really very, well decorated. Yeah, yeah. and, and they're of... they're yeah that that is that someone had the time um, and the gumption to fix you know actually yeah. finish yeah. it yeah. as well as the resources. Yeah. Um, but but San Benedetto was one of the kind of primary targets of Henry the Fourth's kind of wrath against Matilda. Sure. Um, to the to the point where she actually issues a charter in the early 1090s, um, essentially paying reparations to the monastery for having had it Ooh. had built, damage to the buildings um, in the as Henry was kind of marching southwards to Rome um, and basically raising everything in his path. Uh, and and in that charter, that's where she explicitly calls him a tyrant, which doesn't appear in any other document that she writes. Um, and it's just this really kind of ownery, like, I don't like this guy. I don't think he's any good for this this area. Or for uh, the, the world. And it's not a good emperor. It's a tyrant. Yeah. And like, a t yeah, the, the it's like very explicit. Yeah, it's, it's not, uh, word, it's not it? even metaphorical. Yeah. yeah. Do, you have the doc do, you, do you have that manuscript as a manuscript or just transcription of it? Um, I just had the transcription. I can dig it up though. I don't. I just don't know where in my files it is. Uh, Elisa see. asks. Speaking of questions, um, while you look for that, Elisa asks, Bologna did not or cannot become a community comune until her death, and she <laughs> asks if if she did something to stop that because uh, he doesn't know. Um. So that's a really interesting question. It's one that a lot of Matildean kind of Kenosis scholars are trying to unwind. Is what role exactly did she play? Because it's not just Bologna. It's um, Modena as well is also kind of in this period of of pre communal. Remember when like, she died? Government. When was she? Uh, Eleven fifteen. Eleven fifteen. Okay. Okay. Sure. Um. And I, there's a lot that kind of goes on. I can't really speak to Bologna, but I can speak to Modena and um, that they were. They kind of uh, get together in 1099 to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, build the cathedral, the new cathedral, mm -hmm. and they do so in the absence of um, a bishop, which is really unusual. Usually, it's the bishop yeah. who motivates the construction and the funding of a new cathedral, but they didn't have one. They just the previous one had died, and he was kind of a jerk, and they had kind of somewhat elected a new one, but he didn't take power until 1106. Um, so this interim period. We see this like a very powerful um, kind of committee essentially rise up that's made out of um, like citizens, and they essentially kind of uh, they're not strong enough to do it without Matilda, um, and they do eventually call her and the Pope in to kind of uh, mediate a discussion. Um, but it's kind of clear in that that moment that you know her interference in this because this dispute kind of happened between the church and the people. Um, that they weren't really quite there yet, um, and that Matilda was a kind of a key factor yeah. in yeah, the yeah. fact that they reverted to that, you know, after that 1106 discussion yeah. Yeah. Um, and dispute, that they kind of went back to relying on her as a central mediating force yeah. rather than yeah. uh, kind Themself of a more a communal yeah. style like, of government. Yeah. Yeah, so you're basically yeah. almost saying that there was the, the it, they were not quite mature yet to form a commune, and that's Mantua, you said. Sorry. No, which which city was that again? Modena. Modena, Modena. Sorry, Modena. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting, yeah, because uh, as I said, Bologna became becomes a commune in eleven eighteen, and indeed all all places become communes around the time anyway. Like Milan yeah. is ten ninety eight, the first documents, and you know 
it's, it's similarly, a, it's a, her presence in Milan is almost zero. Sure. Um, sure. I mean, you know, so it, there's definitely an argument to be made. And I think some scholars have made this, um, Vito Fumagalli being one of them, mm -hmm. that there is just not uh, that her existing as a powerful figure um, was a, a real kind of decisive factor in this, the kind of more minor cities that at this kind of early kind of turn of the century were waffling whether or not sure. they really had enough um, kind of intercity yeah. power yeah. Yeah, yeah, to kind of break away from the larger feudal power of Matilda. Yeah. Fascinating. I want yeah. to ask about the, about the miniature here, um, the illumination called miniature, miniature in Italian, uh, I think. Um, is it, how common is this to, because of course, it's not only the first illumination of the, of the manuscript, but it's about Matilda, which, how common was it of a woman as a, as a center figure of, of, of a chronicle like this? So basically, I, so a lot of my dissertation and research is trying to balance the fact that we know that women in power were not actually that uncommon. Like sure. that is what modern research now suggests to us in yeah, Europe, yeah. which is great. However, there is so much about Matilda uh, that is really unique and exceptional. And so it's like acknowledging the general rule that like, we now know that this is, it is a common, more common but, than we thought, but. But Matilda, so Matilda, um, having a li living biography, one, this was started in 1112 when she was mm -hmm. still very much alive before she, the gout got her, as it were. Um, so it started, you know, while she was alive. She's not a saint. Um, she's not in any way clergy. She's not a royal uh, member of the royal family. And she, she was is... never sanctified. There was never a cause for her holding it for her canonization. Uh, ca later, 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 but later, not in this much, time. much, yeah. much later. Yeah. yeah so. But, because right when it gets started, she's still alive. an alive, regular. <laughs> so yeah, she's a, a human being. All right. yeah. yeah, she's just hanging out. Um, and so in this period, right, there isn't, as far as I'm aware, in Italy anyway, um, any kind of comparable biography sure. being written about a person that's still alive, that isn't a saint, um, that that's isn't like, a king, yeah. or any of those kind of other extraneous or factors. Or and then, or, yeah. yeah and then add on top of that, the fact that she's a woman. Mm -hmm. um, so it is like on several layers, very unusual. Yeah. Um, now, but if you were to take the fact that, you know, you kind of take all of that away and just render it a biography, um, having a portrait at the beginning, a Makes donation sense. portrait, totally normal, absolutely normal. Yeah, that's, yeah, um, yeah. It's just the, the other kind of uh, intersectional factors that make it very unusual. Other examples um, of uh, of biographies before the 12th century. I'm oh, sorry, yeah, early 12th century already. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There are definitely yeah. they're, they're very much in the same style. I would, would they would be right? Yeah. So this one is unusual in that um, it kind of splits the tradition. So you have the first book, which focuses really heavily on her ancestry. Mm -hmm. um, so it mm -hmm. talks about, you know, her great grandfather and it's kind of the family's ascension and a com or, sorry, accumulation of power. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of talks about how her grand grandfather got the power from the king at the time, um, from helping, helping out during some of the uh, fights of the kingdom of Italy. Um, and it kind of chronicles how the power passes down. And then finally in chapter or book two, it switches over into Matilda's life. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. so you kind of go from like, here's where everything began to, okay, now we're going to run through Ma Matilda's Ma Ma life. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But really interestingly, the manuscript itself, all of the illuminations, with the exception of the very last one um, of the meeting at Canosa, uh -huh. they are all, well, actually, I guess you could ex excerpt um, this kind of fictional portrait uh, as being we're not really sure if it actually happened. We're not sure if she was ever Which... presented this book or if oh, yeah, it was kind part, of, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It yeah. was intended to be presented to her, but we're not actually sure um, if she ever got to see any version of it. She did before. die. And then there's like a letter at the beginning. That's like, Oh, Matilda, we're so that... sad. Right. Okay. Why did you die? <laughs> Wait, what is that letter at the beginning? What is that? Um, so that's the incipit epistle. So oh. it's, it's like at the, yeah, it's, um, and that was written to kind of commemorate um, the fact that she had died yes, and that yeah. this book was intended for. And it sounds like everything was done except for 
maybe like the last bit. And then this yeah. letter was written after she died to kind yeah. of address that, that she had yeah. already passed. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. But she um, no. Did she commission it? Do we, do we assume that, right? Well, that's the thing. So there is... Hmm. I think that's a question. So. My dissertation um, really focuses on this idea that I think that's the most sensible thing. That's, yeah. Who else? She didn't have any heirs. She was unmarried at the time. Um, yeah, and she, she, was, husband, so. no, she was. That was you. That was... <laughs> no, that was real life me who killed all of my husband. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's a, that's an inside joke from the <laughs> stream all last week. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, so, I threw you off there. Yeah. No, that's, uh, so in eleven twelve, right? So she. She was still obviously she wasn't on her deathbed. Mm -hmm. uh, her charters mm -hmm. indicate she was mm -hmm. still mobile okay. to some degree, um, but she was probably she would have been in her sixties or late fifties, uh, was probably feeling the fact that she didn't have any heirs who had survived, um, and she didn't have a husband. And basically, you know what left right then to document your own life. Yeah. Um, the other option would be that London, perhaps. Or? Uh, that the author Donatso actually made it for her mm -hmm. um, as a kind That's of a, a gift. persuasive gift. Yeah. Um, but that kind of raises the question. So he lived at the monastery at Canosa and it kind of would have raised questions of like, he wasn't even like the head monk. He just lived there. So where would he have gotten the funding, the materials? Um, the time really. The, the, yeah, yeah the exa the exactly. Yeah. It, does, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Yeah. And generally speaking, when you have, um, kind of a donation portrait and a dedication, you know, to a person. Mm -hmm. You can usually take that um, to be an actual evidence of the fact that she probably commissioned it, and that we wouldn't have any kind of other evidence per se to say I'm the author. Um, you know, I've been commissioned by this person to write this book for them. It just it would have been implied in yeah, the, the, you know, the yeah. dedication and such. So. I think that she commissioned, probably yeah. commissioned it for herself. Um, then it's just kind of, you know, maybe why? Uh, sure. Other than just, sure. just kind of memorialize yourself, we don't really know Ooh, why. That's a good question. Daniel asks, by the way, if there are later copies of this. There are. Yeah, there are. Um, gosh, I don't have any pictures of them. Uh, hold on. But <laughs> so there are later copies that are made. Um, Gosh, I'm trying to remember where they're actually from. One, I believe, is at Frosinora, which is not that far away. Give me a second. No, <clears throat> right, so we have a copy from uh, 1234, which is at Frosinora, uh, uh, which is now at the Biblioteca Statale in Luca. Okay. Um, and so we're not really sure. Well, I, well I'm, I should say it. I'm not very sure because this was not part of my doctoral uh, research, but um, it's probably likely that they commissioned it um, just to have in their own library because the Abbey itself was founded by Matilda and her mother. Yeah. So it makes sense that they would want to have um, kind of a copy of it. And it is essentially the same. Even the like the illuminations are very much kind of structurally the yeah. same. Yeah. The style is a bit different because it's obviously a hundred years later. Yeah. But... Yeah. 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 Um, let's see, do we have any other, I'm looking at my, my actual dissertation now. Uh, <laughs> so there's a 14th century copy okay. um, yeah, at the Biblioteca of Panizzi. And then there's a 15th century copy um, at the Biblioteca Civica in Modena. And then there's a 16th century copy in copies. Reggio Emilia. Yeah. It's quite a few copies. Yeah. Yeah, so there, there. I mean, which makes sense, particularly as mm -hmm. Matilda kind of enters this canon of kind of very important person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, um, yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's a key circle figure, of course, especially with Nebetri content and all that. Yeah. Yeah, and like entering into the 14th and 15th centuries, she is very close. I think probably the closest she ever gets to actually getting canonized because there are records of kind of mysterious healings happening yeah. at her grave yeah, and stuff, right yeah right. and so it's very clear i think that at some point they were Someone really kind wanted of like, to yeah push that <laughs> yeah like let's make her let's say make her say yeah, yeah 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 of course of course of course didn't, didn't happen though <laughs> didn't happen no no and uh on the sides they don't speak off in himself which is sad i'm sorry for him <laughs> it's uh i know you follow the chat but i wanted you to walk me if you could before we move on to because i know you want to speak about 
the arm being cut off, which is exciting, and uh, the Peter and Paul um, seal. I've I've those notes, and another one you mentioned, which was the Forty Nine R. I don't know what it is. But before that, I'm curious about just, because we're on the, on this on this on this elimination already. Um, transcription below. Matildis Lucens Preco Rocape Cara Volu Volume Volume. Um, Actually, you've got these little kind of inscriptions um, below all of the yeah. illuminations that kind of relate back to the text itself. Um, so like you have a similar one that happens at the the last image um, of Matilda uh, meeting at Canosa. Um, and so these are, oh gosh. Oh, so hold on, my window just closed. <laughs> In the meantime, Tomcats, well, Tomcats, welcome to the joining us for the special event. I'm glad you, you, you didn't miss that. Special event. <laughs> it is a special oh, event. Oh, this oh, is yeah. really exciting. We are chatting for like half an hour about history. It's great. I'm really enjoying this, to be honest. It's really good fun. Okay, you were saying, go. Um, right. So this is kind of, this is one of these interesting statements that appears here because it's not actually, this one isn't particularly referencing the text. It's kind of referencing the image and then the kind of beginning mm. letter, which suggests maybe it was added after. We're not actually sure. Um, but it essentially is like, uh, it's urging Matilda to kind of accept this gift um, oh. from the author himself. Yes, okay. uh, and it's like kind of, uh, you can kind of think of it as like a speech bubble as he's like holding the book up to her and yeah, like, yeah, hey, yeah, yeah. I made a thing for you. Wouldn't you like it? <laughs> uh, what does, uh, you're, you're not remember better than me, um, Matilda's Luch, what, why Luchens? Luchens Precor. Because uh, Hawk, Volume, and uh, Cape, they take, take this volume, right? Mm -hmm. um, What's Luchens? It's, What's Luchens there? Um, so the Luchens actually, so this is kind of a, a, a constant descriptor that's used about, and I, there are some, um, there's a 17th century historian uh, named Fiorentini who uses this to be like, aha, you see, it's because, it, you know, it's it's to reference the fact that she is from uh, Luca. Luca, which, oh. Because it's, it's like, it's um like a friend, you know, like very similar stem. So it means like bright, illustrious, yeah, 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 uh, and it's yeah, it's yeah. it's continually used throughout the the Vita yeah. to kind of just At compliment her and, yeah, and yeah, to yeah, describe yeah. her, yeah. yeah. Um, but Fiorentini's like, no, 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 you know, you see, it's, it's because, because she's, she's from, from Luca. Luca. Okay, Obviously. so I'm not the only one that asked the question, like, what Luca's about? Hey, I'm not. Yeah, it's pretty good, but interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, so he's it's, really it's like uh, shiny Matilda. I pray that you yeah. accept this volume, right? Yeah, so it's like, yeah, so I take it to be um, a little bit less literal than Shining, but like illustrious. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah, which is same, same origins of the... Yeah. 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 <laughs> Excellent. Um, Eliezer asks, uh, do you think she is the one mentioned by Dante in Paradiso? Uh, which, God. I, I don't <laughs> know, which, which, which I'm, I'm, a, I'm an ingrown club dear, Eliezer, can you please quote us the Paradiso line you're thinking about? So... Um, so he's referencing, uh, there's two characters, there's Beatrice and Matilda, yeah. and oh, right. mm -hmm. this is like a whole subset of okay, cool. um, Dantean like, literature of trying to, because obviously, I mean, I don't know how familiar y'all are with um, Dante and, and kind of his, his work, but he drops in a lot of parallels to like real people all the time. All that, yeah. And so there's like a large subset of that literature that's trying to piece out like, who are you talking about? So like, who's the hot They're generally pretty clear, generally pretty clear part. They're not very fake oftentimes, right? They're generally pretty. Yeah, clear. and they're, they're generally pretty straightforward. Yeah. And so there is some convincing, and I, I touch upon this, actually touched upon this in a very, very early draft of my thesis, and I eventually cut it because it yeah. wasn't super related. Mm -hmm. um, but there is evidence that he did go to visit San Benedetto where she's buried, or was buried up until the mm -hmm. 17th century. So there's evidence that he went there and uh, while he was in exile, and evidence that he had came in contact um, with the actual tomb. So it's clear to some extent that he knew who Matilda was. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that she is a guide in, is it purgatory? Oh, sorry, my cat's walking. Get out of here. No, that's um, <laughs> yeah, she, I, I can't remember exactly. Um, but she, I'm pretty sure she acts as a guide while he's like on his way to Beatrice. And there's some compelling um, evidence that some of these uh, Dantean scholars have said, like, this is probably 
Matilda, Matilda of Canossa <laughs> rather than any kind of, and there are, there are other arguments to be made. Um, gosh, I can't remember. There's a, there was another Matilda put forward. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I think it would be kind of nice if it was her, but I can't. <laughs> I don't know that I have enough knowledge to exactly, make like yeah. a real sure. decision. But it's definitely it's definitely a, a strong possibility. Yeah. So the other half of this question um, is yeah. actually kind of the the continuation of my research is yeah. looking at Matilda's legacy after Which, her death. The other half is how well is her story known in the Middle Ages? For yeah. Years. So in the Middle Ages, it's less clear. Um, how much of it does kind of escapes this like local gravitation um, because her, her grave does become somewhat of a kind of a hot spot to visit, but it seems to only really have a very kind of local reputation, i.e. kind of people who are in the region rather than say the whole peninsula or even Europe, you know, abroad. So uh, there's some evidence that, um, where she was buried, San Benedetto, that they moved her tomb around like a ton to uh, be able to accommodate different amounts and volumes of people who coming to visit, okay. and which suggests that there was some waxing and waning of her popularity. Right. right. Um, and then, as I mentioned, that there are some later historians who document. So I'm thinking specifically again of this Fiorentini person. Um, he documents some of the kind of ongoing history of the, the region. And he documents some instances of miracles being kind of accounted for, which is interesting, but um, it doesn't, it kind of, she kind of remains a very uh, locally important person, particularly to the city of Mantua mm -hmm. um, up until 16, God, 33, when she was taken, I'll just say taken sure, by sure. that. If not stolen, depending on you want to say it, yeah. I don't think she was stolen. I think that story is a little overblown. Right, I okay. do think, though, that there was some shady deals wherein the uh, the kind of mayor of the, the city accepted payment for her body yeah. and then didn't tell anyone that yeah. he accepted yeah, yeah, payment yeah, yeah. for it. Fun. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, and, of course, but, to, to, for everybody else, the stories that then people in Mantua accused the, the Rome of stealing the body of Matilda. Yeah, um, and it became this big... Um, it was a real sticking point. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I would describe it as a um, maybe not maybe cult is is too intense, uh, but there certainly was um, local revelry for her. Yeah, they really kind yeah. of respected her as um, as a kind of important figure. So there was uh, a level of veneration, one. if not necessarily worship. Or, yeah, or and I do think. I don't know why, and this is like part of my ongoing research. I don't know sure. why yet there wasn't an official push to actually have yeah. her. Yeah. Um, there was a local, a local, and that means yeah. in doom and all that. And there's, there's clearly the motions to kind of be able to declare um, sainthood, right? You know, the miracles yeah. kind of being one of the first steps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but for some reason, it just doesn't happen. Um, yeah. And I, I imagine there's probably something to do with the Terra Matildas and the disputes about her land, but mm. I don't know yet. Mm. Because of course, the uh, Holy Queen or a whole is a, is a quite a common. It happens quite a lot, so uh, mm -hmm. really strange, isn't it? Um, interesting, fascinating. What else want to say? Nothing. Should we move on to the our nineteen R? The, yeah, let's look at this arm so cutting. Because it, it's, it's okay. Zoom, zoom in on this guy if you can. Which one? Which, it's, one? which one? Oh, the arm cutting. Um, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> this one is one of my favorite. I, like, it's glorious. not really. It's fantastic. It's not really that important, really, kind of contextually. It's just kind of demonstrating that the family, the kind of great grandfather mm -hmm. um, of the Canosan line, is kind of really di directly participating in the. Uh, collection of a relic. Sure. So this is um, Sant Apollonio. So okay. he is the local patron saint of okay. Canossa. Okay. Okay. Um, and he is the kind of the, the dedicatory saint for okay. the church at Canossa. And uh, this is like right after he's died. And they, so my telling of it is that the saint recently passed because you have um, on either side, you have the clergy holding the censer, which usually indicates that there was like recent death and or kind of funeral rites and the really? candles. Yeah. So the censer on the left with the guy on the left is holding, it yeah. looks like a little purse. That's yeah. a censer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, 
Yeah. Um, but that was part of the funerary rites. So it suggests that there is like this kind of great speed at which they are rushing to cut this guy's arm off to make it a relic. <laughs> Um, so this is and a knife, isn't it? Okay, that's what yeah. Then. So, so they're they are kind of cutting right through this guy, um, and it's even though the the illumination's a bit wonky, um, they only kept his arm, even though it's clear that they're like cutting across his whole body, including his head. Only the arm was kind of recorded as the capped relic. Okay. Um, but what I do like a lot about these images, and it's kind of a small detail and it reoccurs and we'll see it a couple times more, um, uh -huh. is the use of the polya, which is this mm -hmm. kind of this Y-shaped linen that the clergy wears. Um, and it, during the 11th century, had really gained steam as you mean, uh, this... the, like the, um, the, yeah. That yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, the common, one, yeah. the mm -hmm. thing that looks like the Y on yeah, yeah, um, yeah, all of the old and, and also both, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of considered, uh, not even kind of considered, had by the time this manuscript was written, had been solidified, particularly by Gregory, but also his predecessors, um, who said, if you want this, which is the only official, you know, sanctified symbol of being a bishop, you mm -hmm. have to come to Rome in person. You yeah. can't. Yeah, you can't send anyone in your place now. You have to do it, and that it kind of stands in as a lo an oath of allegiance. Yep. Um, there's this really great book on it that just came out in like 2015 called The Bonds of Wool by mm -hmm. Stephen Schoenig, and that kind of discusses the development of the polya and its use as like a symbol of loyalty. Um, so and that me kind of... Book again. Tell me the name of the book again, if you could. Bonds, Bonds of, of Wool. Bonds, Bonds of, of Wool. Of wool. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, I got it. Um... <laughs> well, like uh, the H, the, the, the... <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And and this and this. So I, my kind of thesis posits that the appearance of this is very kind of it's a subtle but very meaningful um, appearance of we are on the side of Rome, yeah. like our bishops, our saints. We are all kind of aligning ourselves with Rome rather than. So if you got. Um, if you had your yeah. seat given to you by the emperor, you'd get a ring. Yeah. So that was like, that was yeah. their symbol. Um, yeah. And it was, yeah, it was considered like the poly was the sign to which you were kind of given official power um, to do your duties. Mm -hmm. And you could similarly have it revoked if yeah. you yeah. were found to be lapsed in them. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have two questions here. Um, sure. One, so it means that both the arm cutter and the uh, Apollonio were both bishops. Yeah, good, fantastic. Because right now in the church, I'm pretty sure, well, at least most of the priestly garments I see are like this as well. They have the Y shape too in them, but that's, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know the development. So, so the 11th century is when we see this garment really become like standardized. Right. And it's kind of rise alongside the rise of the mitre being kind of standardized yeah. as yeah. the bishop's garments. Um, and before this, it was not used consistently. So it had always been given to popes, but it, or not popes, bishops. rather bishops mm -hmm. and archbishops, but it was not kind of uh, as official. Yep. It was like you had it or maybe you didn't. And it was kind of fine either way. And then in the like 1050s, it starts to become like, if you want this, you have to come get it. Um, and you can't just send your lackey to do it. You have to come, basically kiss the feet of the Pope, and yep. then you can have it. Uh, you know what I didn't do at all? <laughs> I didn't change the title of the of the stream, so let me do it quickly. <laughs> um, I mean, I could to... talk about Santa Ambrogio, but that would be like my master's that's, right that's, did you, that's cool, though. I didn't know you did that master. I thought it was part of, you look when Milano was a part of your doctorate. No, so I looked at Santo Ambrogio as for my master. This is like in 2014. It's a while ago. That's um, when I started and, university. That's when I started my undergraduate. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yes, I'll just go die in my yes. tomb now. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I did a, a comparative about uh, San Michele Maggiore in Pavia and Santo Ambrogio because they have very similar architectural types and they use um, similar vault techniques. And it's mm -hmm. kind of a, like these two cities were kind of. God, I'm trying to remember exactly what the thesis is about. They were uh, engaged in this like rivalry yeah. for power yeah, as yeah, the yeah. power of one fell as the power of Milan rose. Yeah. Um, and so I kind of look at it as like the exchange of architectural features as 
um, a mark of rivalry. Yeah, yeah. Pavia and Milan has, have, have been at all because Pavia became the capital of the Long, Longobard Kingdom. Um, mm -hmm. while Milan did not, but Milan has always been a wealthier city, generally speaking, yeah. and with a stronger archbishopric by a, by a long shot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and they like to the point where they were they had like continuous armed skirmishes at mm -hmm. each other, and yeah. that's why that's kind of my thesis being like, yeah. and that's how they their churches look the same. <laughs> it's not a very good thesis. It's a masterpiece. That's fine. That's fine. It's a masterpiece. That's that's a rare that we get it. If I'm not mistaken, Daniel says a bishop of Bupalian ring would be too powerful. They had Bupalian ring, generally speaking, because from my understanding, yes. the Pope also so, gave the ring. Yeah, you, the Pope also gave the ring, um, oh. particularly after the Dictatus Papai, where mm -hmm. the, the uh, Pope was like, I can do whatever I want. <laughs> you give out a ring, I'm going to give out a ring. Um, and so he did. Um, and so, yeah, the, the ring, it, it's always i would say like more of a secondary thing sure, like they sure. they have it you can get it um but it's really not what makes you kind of seen as a as a bishop during this period um and it's not the yeah. thing that they're going to take away from you if you're sure. being a bad bishop yeah, so it's there but it's not yeah. like you know and the GD makes a good point that's why bishops are powerful indeed <laughs> that's that's indeed the, the reason <laughs> that i'm that's exactly what happened. Fantastic. I wanted to also pick up on the censor thing, and not not a censorship that they were speaking about, but because um, in my understanding of the use of incense in uh, in Catholic, um, what's that going to call it? Yeah, the Catholic Papa. The Catholic Papa. Wait, that, I want to go back to that first. But <laughs> the censor is. We understand it because, of course, you know, it, it, it occurs in apocalypse, in the apocalypse, right? In the revelations, is that prayers go to God through this the, the smoke of the censer, right? And so, mm -hmm. very much using all, in all, liturgical celebration, really, that are of high of whatever, you know, like generally a daily mass, you would have a censer, but a Sunday mass, yes, you would, right? You would have incense. How? So, because you mentioned, it, it, was it in the eleventh century only used in funeral rites, or no? It so I'm, I'm I'm probably gonna step in it with people who actually look at church objects but my understanding is that they they it were used more frequently um more generally I should say um but definitely so I kind of conclude they this was like a recent kind of death because censors were really important for funeral rites because they couldn't preserve yeah. bodies and they smelled like really bad. Yeah. So, <laughs> so like I, kind of to my mind and like, this is my interpretation. Sure. So sure, who sure. knows? We don't actually know. No, no. Yeah, fair. Um, it's to my mind, right. You have to get up close to this dead body, um, which has probably, you know, it's started to decompose to some extent. Some extent. Who yeah, knows how much? So much. Um, and if they like cut it open, that can't be, you know, to my mind, that would be really gross and probably smell to some extent. Um, and so the sensor is to try to like. I mean, maybe. Okay, okay, apple. okay. Perhaps. But because, of, um, I mean, it, it must have been light anyway, because otherwise the body wouldn't be so fresh, right? I guess also it's quite a, quite a clean body, uh, right? Yeah. In that, in, in that sense. Because, um, uh, of course, um, I. I don't know much about body preservation in the Middle Ages, but they will keep them in, in, in lead caskets. When Henry II dies in whatever, in 1160-something, Henry II, King of England, and, and Duke of, not, 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 and not a German emperor, um, they, they put it in a, in, a, in a lead casket and then let it through, through the whole of France. For, for like veneration or something along those lines. I mean, it, it, yeah. it, it is our sense it's a like explanation. Yeah, possibly, for sure, for sure. But I, overall, incense was used, I'm certain, pro not certain, I'm starting to suspect throughout all religious liberation. I imagine it probably served double duty, yeah, right? Like, I don't sure. think it was yeah. just to cover up yeah. smell, but it yeah. probably, you know, the, the liturgical that. function of it was yeah. probably quite important as well. And indeed, um, you probably cover up smell yeah. also in church, generally speaking, right? I don't, I don't think there's yeah, like, smell oh, particularly nice. <laughs> yeah. The pores <laughs> are here. Um, they, oh, yeah. I love that, that Daniel asked this question because we were talking about this before the stream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, asking, yeah asking about if there is, uh, I'll read it aloud so because the chat is not on live. So, uh, is so, there a reason why I wanted our in particular? Um, and then I guess we cleaned it after moving it. I probably, yeah, go on. You know, I actually, I, I don't want to say I know how they were prepared because I, I generally don't, and it's just not something they talk a lot about, particularly with this relic, but 
my yeah, knowledge Ar of it. Arctic um, right, right? That's something. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure that there's someone somewhere who's thought yeah, about yeah, how they yeah. did this. Um, now, the arm, as I was talking uh, earlier, is actually a really interesting uh, kind of powerful symbol. So they would cut the arm off and then they would kind of encase it in metal. Um, and then they would usually kind of adorn that metal with yeah. like gemstones and gold and like other precious materials. Um, and then they would kind of shape it um, in this kind of blessing hand uh, and this blessing sign, basically, they'd kind of stick it to a pole and they would use it as a, like in place of a processional cross. And you as the kind of a lay person would want to touch it because it's a primary relic, i.e. it's a part of the actual See. saint itself. Um, you'd want to touch it. So it's this kind of, I don't know, really interesting double function of like the bone of the arm is itself in there, yeah. which is important. But then also it's in the shape of yeah. this blessing hand. So it's con like the power of the bone is giving a blessing, but also then the bone itself is making this blessing sign. Yeah. So it's it's a double whammy. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it really, you know, like a processional cross, it would stick up above the crowds. So that would be maybe the only thing you could see as a lay person is just this kind of like glammed out, dismembered arm leading a crowd. Mm -hmm. Then Daniel has put a link about the Yad, uh the ritual Ooh. pointer, Torah pointer. Tell us more about it, Daniel. I mean the yeah. the the, 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 the awesome. Wikipedia article is very small, but um... Oh, I am familiar yeah, yeah. So it's like um, a yacht is like you use it as a pointer, basically, so yeah. you don't touch the actual Torah, correct? Right. I think. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, reading, yeah. I think that's so. Um, it is similar. I'm not sure if they use like arm relics in the same way. Mm, um, <laughs> I strongly suspect that anyway. You know what? You, 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 know. you say that, surprised. but there are okay. so many overlapping traditions between medieval Jews and medieval Christians. Um, and, you know, later on, you also have like the kind of overlap of Christianity and uh, Islam. So, um, but yeah, it's this, this, this very kind of interesting use. Yeah, um, yeah, these yeah, relics yeah. are not just kind of sat around and looked at. They are used in the processions okay. of masses yeah, yeah, to yeah, really yeah. kind of bring a level of prestige to it. I was saying about probably not used as a pointer. Uh, that's all right. Like, I don't know. Describe. How funny would that be? You just like whip out a giant, <laughs> like, blinged I mean, arm. You say that, but like actually, you know, uh, then uh, coercy as a, as a question. And, but in, uh, in, in, in my parish, we have the table. The table in my parish, in, in, in the main office <laughs> of it, is, um, is um, used by St. John Paul II when he came to Scotland. So I guess we do use relics in that sense as well. Quartz asks, is there any relation between this uh, sacred object and the hand of glory as a profane one? I have no idea. What's tell me more about the hand of glory as a profane one? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not um, familiar with that person. So, I, I don't know that the hand of glory and these are, I, I'm not, okay, I'm just going to admit. So, I know this is Greg. Um, this is pretty funny. I, 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 I don't know that there's um, a lot of overlap. I'm looking at this is the hand of glory, looks absolutely obscene um sorry i'm gonna i'm just gonna read about this really quick go this ahead, is not the, something that has ever appeared in Absolutely. my research right it's fair because imagine oh God. so i i do imagine that it's probably an inverse effect right so it looks like this is a you know as you say this very kind of obscene or profane kind of yeah. image yeah. being yeah. the inverse um, or this kind of inverted use of sure. what is otherwise this kind of holy, holy thing yeah. So I can I can see that there might be a relationship there. Similar. I don't know that it is it exists in the 11th century, or actually, when this relic was gathered, it would have been the beginning of the 11th century. Right. Yeah. Um, of but, course. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. I just I don't know this thing. I'm <laughs> like looking at pictures, and it's so ridiculous. Um, but it's not that I mean, it's not that far removed from how some relics sure. kind of exist. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just kind of dismembered body parts, yeah. or yeah. Um, like with the blood the blood at Mantua. Yeah, yeah, it's like bloody soil. Um, you get fingers. Fingers are like Fendi really popular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, hair. Yeah, all kind of heads. You know, heads are yeah. thing. Uh, all same, heads. Uh, I mean, bodies. St. Catherine seen as there as a heady one part and the body in the other part. Yeah. Oh, um, God, I hate that. I hate that head. for her. Yeah, the, it was quite interesting. We went on pilgrimage to 
to Siena, uh, and the, the the body is in Rome, and the head is in the church in Siena, and I, one of our friends like I that's really I'm no <laughs> I'm out of it. I, I guess <laughs> I guess her her head's just in another place. Isn't it, it is. It is. Yeah. Just yeah. It is. It is. It's, I guess it is. Yeah. It's in the clouds. Uh, <laughs> Okay, fantastic. Let's subscribe this video right on top. Actually, let's do both pictures because why not? Because that's what we're here for. Because there, there are two sections of, of this of this illumination, right? Of the. So of the we also, cafe. so the um the above part yeah. of it is um the kind of this gift uh, of relics, and that's why they've kind of got these like, clo like covered hands, um because that's that was kind of a traditional way to display. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, both to actually in real life hold on to like boxes of relics or relics yeah. themselves as you'd have like a covered hand. Yeah. Um, but it's also this idea that we have Matilda's ancestor quite literally bowing to the authority um, of the king who was the one that kind of in instituted the power um, for the line of Matilda and Canosa. Um, and that they're kind of, it's showing this really sacred relationship between the crown and the family. Yeah. Um, which seems a little nonsensical if you kind of consider Matilda's relationship with, with the crown her. in her own life. Mm -hmm. um, but I think a lot of that's got to do with the fact that uh, this is really trying to show that like, I am not, I like my family is not going against the crown. We love the crown. We're best friends with the crown. But we gave he's a tyrant gifts to the crown. Therefore, but this yeah. this one person is yeah. terrible and we don't yeah. like him. Yeah. Um, and it kind of throughout the text, it kind of tries to steer around Henry yeah. um, and try to make as many connections to the imperial family, not kind of including the fact that Matilda's mother is actually like literally related to the king. Like she's cousins Good emperor, with right, Henry. And, you know, they don't really talk about this because this is focusing more on Boniface's, her father's uh, kind of side of the family, um, but really trying to just steer around what is this very obvious obstacle to saying we're very we're very much in line with the king. We're not we're not trying to dissent or anything. Yeah. It's just that this king is really awful. And we hate him. Yeah. 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 And it's is why someone has beards and some don't. Is that a for that? I, <laughs> I don't know that there's might, a reason. It might not be. Might so not be. for some... <laughs> Some people, um, so, right, you've got, like, these background people that have beards uh, or have beards, don't have yeah, beards. Yeah, it's both. That things, yeah. it might just be, as far as I know, that's not trying to, like, Say situate anything. them as any specific person. Um, you do have this idea that, like, you're, there's some continuity between the scenes. So you'll yeah. see the same characters having the same haircuts oh, or the same cool. vestments yeah, or the same hats. And it's just to kind of visually identify them. Now, if we were talking about saints, then saints kind of all have these I very, the very particular, details. yeah, um, signs basically that we use to say like, oh, that's Paul, that's Peter, yeah, uh, yeah or you know, but whatever. And they're generally not just a beard, of more, more often than not. So they're I mean, sometimes it is it's literally just like a beard? he has yeah. a long, pointy beard, and the other guy has a short, scruffy beard. Really? So that is means that which yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. in like oh, yeah. with the apostles, gosh, I'm going to get raked across the coals oh, by my, <laughs> but like usually, so actually in 76, that little tiny roundel, mm -hmm. um, there's oh, nothing that identifies goes. who these people Let's are, go to Let me go to that. just that the fact that they have the traditional attributes of Peter and Paul. Yeah. Because they don't have the, the, the sword or the. Or right. There's no other way of telling who these people are other than the <laughs> fact that they like one kind of always looks like this. Share. Yes. It, yeah, because there is no oh, Peter Paul. Just yeah, it says on top there. Cool. We know that Peter and Paul. Fair, 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 fair. What I want to ask, I want to ask about um, just a travel thing. Well, let, let's look at the, and then we can move on to the next part before we run out of time. Just to answer, oh, yeah. um, yeah, Daniel. So yeah. Peter has the the long. Pointy, pointy beard, beard and, Paul, and Paul has the short scruffy beard with the the monk's fringe and that's a standard like you it's can standard. go yeah you mm. like even um going into like the renaissance they'll, they're still typically depicted with that very kind of like you give him this shaped beard and that will always be peter it doesn't matter or whatever it doesn't matter if he's holding the keys or not and then you've got paul who's always like has this weird Scruffy. He's usually a little older too, so he's usually got white hair when it's colored. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, 
so we we transcribe there is a transcription clearly I, I don't quite catch the connection between the two the two images here though so one is transcribing relics clearly of the body of saint something lauren Lor, lauren i don't know what saint lauren is and the other one is saint victoria victorus victorius so it's it's a uh, vittore corona those are like the relics in that box so they've got Victory and then they've Corona, got Corona. Corona no, so Laura. it's like the two, yeah, um, and they're just in both parts, just being like, we're giving yeah. you a gift. Yeah, yeah, and below here, it's just cutting arms off, and the, it, the connection is basically that the ancestor of Matilda was both Bo crown loving and a holy guy, because get products. Is that more yeah. or less? Am I getting the... They're not so related. I mean, they're related in that you've got the gift of relics or the acquisition of relics. So in that kind of very general way they're mm -hmm. related mm -hmm. but it's really to show this idea as you said like this dualistic idea that the family is both um very religious very pious very respectful of this kind of saint order particularly of santa Apollonio, who yeah. is the patron saint of Pinoza, yeah. mm -hmm. but also that they were willing to kind of barter in these relics in order to show fealty and respect i get you right okay cool makes sense makes sense makes sense i i, I love the you know you mentioned Ray, the gloves and it's great because we still do that in the church, right? Like if you, if you, I don't know if you're born or being, but if you go to, let's say, adoration of the Eucharist, uh, the priest has like the glove, like the mantle here, yeah, to hold the the thing. Yeah, it's it's fantastic actually. I it's pretty cool to see that here. I'm quite I'm quite impressed. Excellent. Next we have we have five minutes. What do you want to cover in that five minutes? Uh Oh, you know what? Let's go. Let's go all the way to the last image of Matilda at the meeting of Canosa because it's such a good image. And even though mm -hmm. I'm talking, I like not stopped talking about Canosa. It seems since I finished my dissertation, but Fine. which one is it? It's such a uh, so it's uh, um, forty nine. Forty nine, of course. Yeah, there we are. And that's uh, aside from that little roundel is the last full page illumination of the manuscript. Mm -hmm. I could have um, before. Oops. <laughs> and we've so this is really interesting in that it's. The kind of the only image that they show of Matilda's life. Um, mm -hmm. You could kind of take the first one, the donor portrait, as being real if you accept that it happened, but we're not sure. So it might be a fictional scene. It might mm -hmm. have actually happened. That's not really clear. But this definitely happened. Um, and this is a really interesting scene because um, previously it's been interpreted as this is Henry, who's the one kneeling. Um, he's at the gates of Canosa and he has kind of entered in this negotiation period already. But it actually, I think, um, I think it refers directly to the text. And this is how they describe it, that Henry um, needing to put together this council. He approaches, first he approaches Hugh of Clooney, who's the big guy in red. Yeah. And he's like, please help me. I just don't want to be excommunicated anymore. <laughs> and he's like, oh, wish I could. But like, <laughs> I, I can't. Cannot be on me yet. <laughs> yeah, this is Matilda. Like, Matilda could help you. Yeah. Like, uh, I, I can. Um, and so the inscription kind of refers to, like, where he asked the abbot, he begs of Matilda. Rex um, and then abate, like, Matildam supplicat atque. Okay. And yeah. he goes to Matilda yeah. and is, like, essentially in the story, in the Vita Matilda's mm -hmm. story anyway, begs Matilda to, like, intervene specifically on his behalf. Uh, it's probably not how it happened. She was probably one of a panel and the panel kind of like worked together to negotiate some sort of truce between the two parties. Mm -hmm. But obviously it's her biography. So she's so, going to be yeah, the star. She's the main guy. Yeah, of course. So main girl. In this image, um, I actually think that this is probably part of that kind of early negotiation stage. So he's yeah. not yet even come to like, I don't know, even being close to being forgiven. Um, and she's sitting. Me? So, Oh, he's okay. holding, just, he's just holding his robes. Like in this, it's like kind of this uh, sign of penance, of like oh. desperation. So you have to think that like during the 11th century and 12th century, mm. um, the ability to communicate uh, feelings and emotions were really quite limited to gestures. So mm. gestures are where we kind of get a lot of the information of how this scene's unfolding. Yep. So one, the fact that Henry is kneeling is really important but it's also the fact that he's like kind of grasping his robes like mm -hmm. in desperation mm -hmm. um but then you kind of look at the configuration of the image so one of the things that like our history really likes to do is look at the relative scale of these people yeah so hugh is clearly the largest person and that makes sense uh because he's a member of the clergy and matilda was also a very faithful adherent to the papal reform which 
clearly prioritized the clergy over even the highest lay person. Yeah. So the lowest of the low clergy was still higher than the highest yeah. lay. Yeah. 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 So he is, of course, of course. like the big guy. Yeah. Uh, he's sitting on a, a little fold stool, which is just like a portable throne for bishops. I, I, I think Daniel suggests it's a living dog. Uh, it's probably, probably not the case. <laughs> <laughs> yes, an actual greyhound. <laughs> just, just he's greyhound, like yeah. Mr. Burns. He just has like <laughs> puppies <Burns>. around. <laughs> he sits upon them. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so he's he's kind of he's wearing the traditional red of the mm -hmm. abbots at the time of Clooney. Mm -hmm. And he is kind of gesturing to Matilda, like, this is your problem. <laughs> How are you oh. going to fix this? I thought it was gesturing um, to Henry. Okay, interesting. But no, no, Matilda. So it's a real interesting triangle because Matilda is looking at Hugh and Hugh is looking at Matilda. But Henry is looking at Matilda, Matilda. but no one's looking at Henry. Henry is the it's least funny, important. Like, it's who cares about Henry. It's not important. We don't, we, don't, we don't hate him. I mean, yeah, truly, they are yeah. kind of making it very visually clear that he is not important. He's the smallest figure. Mm -hmm. He's on the lowest mm -hmm. level. Um, now you can argue actually that Matilda and Henry are about the same size, which yeah, is important Matilda's because tiny. Yeah. I, well, she's also a tiny she's woman. A woman. Yeah, of course, woman. It's good but really importantly, it's really kind of interesting that they've chosen to depict the king, right? Mm -hmm. And Matilda, a duke on the same exact scale. Yeah. And if that weren't clear enough to be like, all lay members, like, you're all equal. You're all garbage, basically. But then they've elevated Matilda on this, like, elevated seat. Um, yep. So she's kind of yep. under, probably, it's just probably um, a Lots throne that has. Questions. Oh, gosh. Whoa. Ah, sorry, no. I'm just looking at the questions. Oh, um, there's only one question. No? Oh, two questions. Okay, no, so... Daniel makes a really good point that the the colors of Matilda and Henry and are the same, the same true, actually. but they're actually inverted. So what's on her um, external oh, cloak that's is true. what was on his internal and vice versa. Yeah. Um, and that, I think that's, this is what kind of write about my thesis that that is really tried to show that they are the opposite same. ends of the same Spec spectrum. Yeah. Basically. Yeah, they're both equally be below the clergy, but one is, and it, yeah, one's one's doing the good thing. The yeah. other one is has been no. excommunicated. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it really um, just visually it helps bind them together because yeah, Hugh is this out here all in red. He sits alone visually, rightfully so because he's big. a member of the yeah, 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 and it's yeah. much bigger than everybody else. Yeah, but you have this kind of interesting connection visually between the two that you just kind of yeah, it looks like they are the same, but not quite. Um, so it's a little topsy turvy yeah, in that respect. That's, that's beautiful. Actually. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's just this really beautiful kind of um, dynamic relationship where Matilda she's kind of she's kind of has her hand extended uh, in one hand and she's got a pointed finger in the other, mm -hmm. which is generally a sign of like receiving words while also giving words. So it's mm -hmm. indicating some sort of exchange yeah. between her and Hugh. So it's clear, as in the text, that she's not interested in Henry at all. It's not interested in Henry's salvation, really, at all, either. But is interested in doing what's right as according to the clergy. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. she was so, like, you have to do this. This is the right thing to do. And she's like, If you say that, okay. Mr. Mr. Bishop, Mr. Mr. Abbott, uh, well, <laughs> yeah, I have very to. <laughs> important, very important Abbott Clooney, for sure. Um, um yeah it's <laughs> actually i'm gonna send you a picture so uh, uh, actually i sent you the auto one already the enthroned yes, picture yes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna open it. um but these in kind of these seated portraits both at the beginning and the end are really reminiscent of these leader portraits so this yeah. is one i draw on really specifically this is of otto the third author the third um, so, which to remind us he is the king before henry the first isn't it or the second really so is it late no so otto is the one before Con no henry or conrad i don't know he comes before them he's the last yeah he's, he's, he's last one Tony. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. and it's our sense um, like uh, keeping a bad child that is true that's accurate to that. that is exactly that's <laughs> yeah, actually i mean it's there is this real point. kind of scolding to it like he's mm -hmm. on his knees mm -hmm. he looks yeah, like, yeah. like a sad child like i'm sorry <laughs> really? i did but like we kind of you know once you contextualize it in the larger story it's like well, he's not really sorry. At all. And it probably like, wasn't as humble as that, I suspect. Yeah. He gets yeah. re excommunicated in like and three it's like, years. Like, uh, screw it. I'm going to conquer you now. And it gets <laughs> me done. I have a bigger army. Okay, look at Tony Otto. Yeah. So he is, yeah, so, he was the last yeah, great. So, 
Very similarly, we have this like kind of trope of enthroned leader where yeah. they are kind of flanked by the important people. Yeah. And we see this yeah. really importantly mirrored in the first one. But the idea of being enthroned um, not only does it have obviously like Christological implications of, you know, the state of Sapiente. Yeah, 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 obviously yeah, yeah, with a woman, uh, you know, taboo. Yeah. Um, but it's drawing on this idea that she has authority and has leadership power in this yeah. role. And even yeah, yeah, though yeah. it's secondary, it's still the most still, important thing that we mm -hmm, should be focusing mm -hmm, on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I must admit, um, when I look at her, her, her throne, it looks like a pile of cushions, you know, like in, in the <laughs> yeah. royal rings. And I'm like, the Hobbit, I uh, a pile of cushions <laughs> below the visit of her. It's not quite. I mean, by all like accounts, people that have written about her stature, which truly weren't many, they were like, she's very tiny and she may have had red hair. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah nice. there you she's go. She's quite hairier. No, she has a wee head on there. Yeah, she, oh, so that's another important thing is that she is never depicted with hair, which is not that unusual yeah, for women during normal, the time. It? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's really, um, this is, would have been more, it's more in line of what you would have seen with um, kind of women being in a, in a monastery if something that was like covered very specifically not just for a regular everyday look but more to be um kind of cloistered away yeah 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 so i'm going to send you another picture of yeah. something that i think there's this interesting um visual connection to they're called chiboria um yeah. Yeah. and yeah. they are a kind of ecclesiastical architecture that happens over the yeah. altar in churches especially um, now in this, churches apparently yeah, it's very common. yeah and this is in so this is one in savannah which is part of her territory um and it's from uh savannah, the ninth yeah. century savannah, yeah and Ligur, it's Ligurian, right. mm -hmm. um yeah and so this is now it's unlikely she's actually standing under one of these because oh, it would have been the, really okay. unusual mm -hmm. But visually, it appears that Donitza, okay, the author, yeah. is drawing on this inspiration to kind of communicate, even though she's kind of terrestrial authority, she is still kind of being blessed by extraterrestrial authority. And of course, that um, was also God. under under a similar a similar construction. Yeah. 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 That's neat. That's neat. <laughs> Which yeah, the um, for for Byzantine emperors, that's also very common uh, depiction them seating. Kind and then I'm just going to send you one more. Cool. Um, this is from the Liber Legum. Um, it's kind of looking at the, the Longobard uh, laws that were set up during, gosh. Whoever, whoever did the, the illuminations for Matilda was a better illuminator than this, I must say. Yeah. Well, yeah, these are a bit rudimentary. Um, but this cool. configuration is quite popular um, okay. from the Lombard rulers. This is kind of literally, it's more of a legal text than a religious. Um, but this configuration where you have the two important guys and then you have like the person down below taking notes ah, um, that it, it really it's like this embedded idea this isn't like a configuration that they came up with uh -huh. they're kind yes. of clearly referencing established tropes from tropes. leaders yeah awesome fantastic and daniel says he, <laughs> he gives you hope for himself and me too and me too for sure he looks <laughs> like a center the guy on the left on the right it's yeah Right. They're like they're not yeah. great. Um, but I don't know. I mean, and, like, they are great. They're better than they could do. And also, like it's it's on parchment, but it's it's very beautiful. The the parallel there is very clear. I I love the guy on the right. His face is just like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> they ask what you know what the story behind the. Ooh, let's see. Can we? Do you have a better? Do you have a better one of this? This is quite blurry. I, I don't know. No, okay. <laughs> you can probably I want to transcribe no, you it. can probably Google it. Um, I don't know what's actually at the top of that. This was so purely. Pippin Glorious, uh, so the, I think it's, yeah, it's Pippin, so the father of, he's looked like an Allo's Swim character. I don't know what that means, but what's an Allo's Swim character? Yeah, like kind of like goofy on purpose. Oh, I see, like I see, poorly I see. drawn on purpose. <laughs> I see, I see, I see. Um, anyway, capitally, but this is a legal text you said, right? Yeah. So this is, I kind of use this to demonstrate this, that these types are not just kind of arising yeah. spontaneously, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, that they're really consciously, and this is not that unusual, truly, uh, that manuscripts borrow visually from other manuscripts because that's yes. just what's available. Um, and a lot of times it does tend to be religious, but also you have these kind of uh, configurations yeah. that lean really heavily on legal texts. Mm -hmm. And then, um, that brings me to a question I have, which is how 
because of course this manuscript we know we are we are identifying the really the mean the symbolism behind these eliminations besides the story right just just eliminations how much they are emphasizing the detachment from henry and the connection to the pope and the power of Matilda. but who but my, my thing I'm, I'm wondering is how much would this be spread uh, what influence would this have on the populace in a sense you know what i mean like in a sense like they're clearly making statements of power but like what is the power for because i don't think henry was gonna come and read the, the, the matildas right you know what i mean <laughs> i mean truly that's one of the things that remains a mystery right um because you, then you kind of it comes back to well if she commissioned this then why why yeah, um it's, it's... was it I, I and now i think it was given as a gift um it was intended to be kind of given to matilda and then again gifted to probably san benedetto which is where she ended up being buried she donated all of her land and her patrimony to the to the monastery okay, okay. Mm -hmm. so it's possible that it the intended monks. to eventually go yeah. there um which then would have been kind of I, wouldn't, I don't want to say relegated because it was a very large community and it was under the, the sea directly of the Pope, but also of Cluny. So it was one of the most important um, yeah. in the area. So it would have been quite large. So it, it would have been for a medium audience compared to sure. really if it was just for her, yeah. just maybe yeah. one. Yeah. It's not like she had children to read it to or to like look at. Behold, my, I'm great. <laughs> um, but, so it's it's unclear. I, I don't know. It's difficult to tell, I think, with these biographies because yeah. a lot of the time, right, they happen after the person's death. So it it's becomes not, for the not a yeah. right. It's for like the people after them, and then you have to look at well, what are they trying to do with this legacy? Mm -hmm. um, but with Matilda, there's a lot of questions of if if she commissioned it, which I believe she did, then what was she gonna do with it? Mm -hmm. No, because. Uh, um... I, I thought I had when you mentioned the, you know, this text with some clear messages in it, besides, you know, is in a important mass community, well, that influences, you know, intentionally, inten intentionally, intentionally influences the education of the monks. And of course, as we know, that, that spread, right? Because there was communication between different mass communities. And therefore, having a text like this that strongly implies pro people messages, then, you know, it, it reinforces this authority maybe yeah. just to just to just say no. there's so there's also the gospels of matilda which were a gift to san benedetto um which are just kind of straight up gospels they're not a biography at all and um, that were done in 1099 mm -hmm. around that period mm -hmm. um yeah, and yeah oh they're beautiful they're they're absolutely beautiful um and those were intentionally created so that they would sit on the altar um, they had a list of names that would be read out at the beginning of every single mass. So it was really intentional that they were like putting this gift from Matilda with very kind of uh, pro papal kind of images yep. Yep. Uh, and stories kind of selected to be yep. uh, illuminated. That was very consciously put on the altar. So that was kind of there all the time. Um, it's unclear if the Vita would have ever served a similar purpose or if it was Probably just like, like yeah, yeah, we'll I'm going to die. I might as well write it I'm down. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm glad you did. Um, Daniel asks if Pano Panofsky, Panofsky is, uh, is a good... Yes. Highly recommend Panofsky. Okay. Okay. He is okay. 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 Uh, really excellent. Um, if you're interested, also Krautheimer. Um, Krautheimer is... He does a lot more architecture, but he does a lot of... I, I draw on him a lot for looking at um, kind of mimetic copies of the Holy Rotunda in Jerusalem. Right. Uh, right. And looking at San Lorenzo in Mantua. Can you can um, you spell his name for me, please? Sorry, say, say that again? Can you spell his name for me? I'm oh, right. I'll put it in the chat. Good. I'll put it on the Discord as well. Oh, sorry, sorry, it's there. Primer. There you go. Yeah, I got that right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me put, let me, I'm going to put it in the fun part of it so that we... Panofsky and Krav. Thank you. It's good to have... Resources. Yeah, those those are real staples um, in understanding. I mean, I'm not sure how easy they are to read. I no. think it's fine. I think I'm anyone. Daniel, you're a smart guy. So yeah, you Daniel, I believe in you. I think you could do you're, anything. You're a history major you. plus an engineer. You should be fine. Yeah, we believe in you. If you okay, could absolutely. get the the emperor to be naked, you could read Panofsky. <laughs> That's a really good point. That's a really really good point. Um, Doctor Blair, 
Uh, 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 and I think I think that that brings us to to a close. That was fantastic, actually. We yeah, we did so like I... no paleography. Maybe next time you're on, which would be great. We can do actual paleography only. Maybe maybe because it, I mean as I would mind. As long as it's not a translation, as long as there's zero translation happening, oh I don't God, care. I, I, I always, I'm always so I'm always so. I'm always so embarrassed. I'm like, let me try to translate. I'm like, I actually have no idea what anyone's saying. Okay, bad. Let's move on. Let's change topic. Let's change topic. <laughs> oh god. Um, well, if anyone has any questions, uh, yeah, please. Right, that's a good can I, I, let's let's have a fifteen minutes question situation if there are any. Yeah, um, you can uh, you can challenge me on Twitter, I guess, I or leave me alone. That's fine. I, I don't know. That's probably. I mean, I think was watching. Um, yeah, that is fantastic. Elizar, you should come on as well for a similar thing. I would love yeah, about, about your, research. About your topic and stuff. Um, that would be good. Any questions or just? I mean, you're very welcome. Uh, everybody's thinking and thanking you, especially that was. You're um, all very welcome. You're very welcome, yeah. I was, that, you know, you. this reminded me of your podcast you did, but it was much more Matilda and much more This is how I give all of my presentations. <laughs> just like, I just get up there and I'm like, I had a whole paper written, but it's fine. We're just yeah. going to talk. <laughs> oh, God, that was, that was really interesting. Um, yeah, maybe next time we can, uh, unless you have more things to say, which I'm sure you do, and I have a lot to listen to, but we can also do a bit of... The sun oh, transcription, which would be next time. I want to talk. I realize I haven't ooh, talked about ooh. the Gospels of Matilda with like anyone, and that is a great oh, little. Uh, hey, why don't we do that? Do you, do you have them? Do you, can we can we put them? I have. This? I don't have great images um, of the text. That's the problem. I have I great see. images of the illuminations. Okay. 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 Well, they're, at the, we um, they're at the Morgan in New York, which is really fortuitous there for me. Go. We can go there. Put them in the pictures. I did. I got to, to I mean, touch it the, and hold it. For the stream, I mean, oh, we can also see them online. Actually, look at that. Let's see. No, that's only the first page. That's not great. I mean, it's good. This one's yeah. Am I on the right? Oh. Is that what we're looking at? Look at yeah. This did they put up new pictures? Oh, the Let's sons see. of bitches! I'll be very upset <laughs> if they did. Yeah, I think that's just the first one. They. They stonewalled me for like years, like literally two years. It took them to give me good pictures of things. Oh, and I was man. Like, no, yeah, it's all online. No, no, maybe it's not. Maybe it's not. I shouldn't badmouth them. I'm sorry, the Morgan. Please hire me as a fellow. <laughs> <laughs> she she will come to work for you guys. Don't worry. You <laughs> good pictures. Um, give me a hand. What what do we have here? Is this? What is so this? it's it's a collection of gospels. Um, it, are these all I mean, the gospels? All, all the stuff Sorry, in the streamer now. Yeah, so this was these were commissioned by Matilda to uh, be given to San Benedetto. Oh, exciting yeah. stuff. Yeah, these are the ones that they super suspect are not finished yet. Um, oh. I don't know. So They're this like is actually happening. the list. I think it's the. Are and they've got really beautiful. Um, I I, I kind of look at it from a, a construction of holy violence perspective. So like pre-crusades, okay. the formation yeah, of the superiority yeah. and uh, the kind of weaponization of the faith and papal supremacy and yeah. the use of sanctified violence. It's all really exciting. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it, I've, I've, I, I know. I mean, I'm not an expert in this, but I know, I've done some work. I'm reading really on this stuff as well. Very interesting. When, when, I, looked, when I studied Patrini Milan, that was... Uh, uh, that's that's the topic comes up. That would be great. Maybe we can do that next week or the week after. That would be probably to be like sent. and subscribe, guys. Like yeah, like and I mean, there is no like or subscription you can do, but I guess I, I want to put it on YouTube as well. So maybe that we can subscribe and like there. Like and subscribe <laughs> wherever you are. Oh god, that was fantastic. And I guess there are no questions. Smash the like button. <laughs> exactly. That's not a question. That's not a question. No, just a statement. You should do it. Yeah, absolutely. Or we can just tweet tweet about it. I guess I don't know. I don't, yeah. I don't know. This, I don't know. Right. This being online thing. What we were talking about at the beginning that we are both actually pretty ignorant on the whole. On my the whole Twitter. Topic. I'll put my Twitter on oh, here yeah. if you guys want to come um, and shout questions into the void at me. It's the same as my Twitch name. Definitely don't have any <laughs> other Twitch <laughs> definitely names. Definitely, there is no other Twitch definitely, name that you're known for. Definitely don't. Zero, it's only ever my name. Yeah. That's it's just always that out far. Uh, oh you guys can't Lord see Lord. me, but I'm I'm winking like. The... <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. That is true. Stop <laughs> the whole time. That is true. <laughs> Just consistency, you know. It is, Just it's the most important thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. 
So feel free to shout any questions at me. Um, or again, as I said, or you could just leave me alone. <laughs> That's also fine. It's also fine. All right. Thank you very much. I think this this marks the end of today. And then tomorrow is the weekend. So that's pretty good. That's quite nice. Do you have any plans for for then for the end of the week? No, I have Zero a paper plans. to work on. Oh, that's a plan. That's a plan. That's a good plan. No, I have like three papers nice. to work on. That's, that's great. I mean, I would say it's a lot, but it's I guess it's work. So that's good. Um, yeah. And on Monday we'll be back with something. I don't know what we're gonna do on Monday. We'll see. If something inspiring, we'll do that because I'm getting bored of my documents. I might not say. <laughs> I mean, they're great, but I look at like hundred of them a day, so it gets it gets a bit of lot after That's a while. Fair. You know? I don't ever get sick of the Vita Matilda. This is beautiful. It's pretty good. It's really beautiful yeah. actually, and it's really easy to transcribe as well, especially now after. I mean, I say that after I done like twenty page of transcription of it. <laughs> it's like okay. it's, it's great. Also, no problem. It's also a presentation copy, so it's super neat. Yeah. Oh god, that copy is fantastic. It's really, really, really precise. It's really good. It's someone's, again, it's someone's, like, mediocre attempt, but they wrote it really nicely. Really well. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the beginning you were saying how if, unless it was finished, they wouldn't have done all the all the yeah, eliminations. Like, in, in my paper, unless I finish, my, my Excel, my, my graphs are, like, all over the place until I finish, <laughs> until I actually finish the thing. I'm like, what well, push it. Make put the names to be consistent somewhere and not just random. It's glorified clip art. You just kind of like look at this paper. It's okay, but look at these pictures. Aren't they nice? Isn't it good? But I'm, I'm like Plato and, and, uh, and Virgil, but look at the I'm pictures. I'm like Horace. Don't you know I'm great? I'm doing this for you, Matilda. <laughs> oh, very good. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, everybody, for watching. We had a whole eight to nine people watching constantly. Yeah, that's that exciting. Nice. That's great. Again, my paragraph is not as exciting as actually interesting topics. <laughs> Just going to have to do the best spot then. Just like have have historians on every week. That's not that. That would be fun. That would be really fun, to be honest. That would be great. I would love that. <laughs> that would be really interesting. You're going to have to. <laughs> you're going to have to recruit Elizard and Hildebrand next. And be like, I mean, that, El me. Elizard already said it will come on when it goes to Bologna. So I'm, I'm counting on him. <gasps> you uh, could do live from Bologna, from the archives. Live from the archives. Oh, that would be terrible. That would get you banned real quick from the archives. Yeah. People would get so annoyed at you. Oh, God. <laughs> and this one else like a show actually. It also lets me land. Actually, that would be great. Oh, I should speak to him. Mm. Jacob, you should come on and talk about food. That would be fun. No, Jacob, Daniel, you want to talk about uh, Milanese rice? That would be great. Yeah, that would be great. Or Jewish traditions. That would also be very fun. That would be really interesting, actually. That would be really cool. Be I'd really love cool. to learn. I I know almost nothing about like medieval Jews. I want to know yeah. everything I possibly can. Yeah, all I know is from Daniel, basically. Bit of research I've done, to be honest, and also of course from Crusader Kings Three, where we have you know, uh, a medieval Jew becomes a king of, of Romania. <laughs> that, that was <laughs> I'm in the middle of waging war on him, so we'll see how that goes. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. I mean, to again, I'm. We could look at the Cunio Sanitatis so or look at Jewish sources or oh, lost in Jewish sources. That'd be great. They also be a language, no idea what it's about, so that'd probably be hard to describe, but. It'd be really hard transcription to do Hebrew rather than Latin, you know. A bit different. A bit different. Yeah. Any Hebrew. <laughs> At least I know a little bit of Latin. That's true. <laughs> Hebrew is like, mm. Excellent. Right. Thank you very much. Have a beautiful evening. Actually, I'm going to stop streaming now.